on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. Please join me in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And may this not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. says, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken for you, from you, it will be yours, otherwise it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up into heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's coat that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? He asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left and he crossed over. This is the word of God. You may be seated.
passing of prophetic leadership from uh, Elijah to Elisha, his, his protege. And in fact, if you've ever heard the phrase, passing the mantle, it comes from this passage in 2 Kings chapter 2. So we talk about what that looks like a little bit. Um, we, we actually celebrated a mantle passing of sorts a couple weeks ago when we talked about Pentecost. Uh, Jesus said when he was on earth, he said to his disciples, unless I go away, uh, Holy Spirit won't come. And, and, but if he comes, and if I go and he comes, then you'll do greater things than I did. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus ascends into heaven, and 50 days later, the Spirit comes and, and indwells and empowers those first followers of Jesus, just like he, he indwells and empowers us so that we can fulfill the great commission and the great commandment. And so today we're going to talk about this, this idea of laying a mantle down. What does that look like? What does it look like to pick a mantle up? But before we do all that, uh, I, just want to, I just want to start with a word of prayer. Can you join me in a word of prayer? God, thank you. Uh, for the time we have to spend together. Thank you for your word. Um, I thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that, that indwells us and that empowers us to, uh, to follow you, uh, illuminates your word to us, and uh, helps us to fulfill uh, the great commandment and the great commission. So, so this morning, God, give us eyes to see what you're showing us in your word. Give us ears to hear what your spirit is speaking to us and gives hearts with desire uh, to follow you and to do what you say. And, and as we do that, may we become more and more like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. I spent uh, a week this past week at, at a camp called uh, Camp People Sky in Piedmont, uh, Missouri. Incredible camp. And our, the directors are here today. And I got to tell you, they are, the, the, you guys. I hope our kids, I'm, I'm, I'll talk to our guys when we get to this camp, because it's amazing. I was in chapel one night, uh, 94 kids made, uh, made a decision for Jesus, and it was, it was amazing, so I appreciate the work that they're doing. I was inspired, and it was just this idea of mantle passing was just baked into what I was seeing. Uh, I'm looking at all these young kids and thinking that was who I was in 1979. I was that young kid who raised my hand, went forward, and made a decision for Jesus. And I, I can't wait to see what God's going to do with, with these young folks. Um, so what is a mantle? I mean, let's kind of talk about that for a second. A mantle uh, in, in, in the passage is, is a cloak or a cape. Um, it would have been worn in, in Elijah's day. Uh, kings would have had mantles. Prophets would have had mantles. Certain positions would have had this you know, this thing that you wore that, that you're like, when you looked at that person, you go, oh, they, they fulfill a, a, a particular role or they have a particular function in society. And, and Elijah would have had this, we don't know exactly what it looked like. Some people thought it would have been like a, a hide with hair on it. Um, and he would have worn that. So when people saw Elijah walking down the street, they're like, oh, that's the prophet of God. We, we know who this guy is. So we don't know what exactly what it looked like, but he had this, this mantle. And in the story... We're based at the end of his earthly ministry. In the story, God sends a whirlwind to take Elijah from earth to heaven. But before that happens, uh, Elijah takes Elisha on kind of a, a greatest hits tour. And they visit some of the uh, most historic places in the Promised Land. They go to Gilgal, which is the place where uh, they very first camp, the, 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 the Israelites very first camp when they came to the Promised Land. They went to um, Bethel, which was the first place that Abraham worshipped God when he came in to Canaan. They went to Jericho, which was the first Canaanite city that was conquered. And they went across the Jordan River on dry ground, just like the Jews did when they came to the Promised Land. And then God shows up. He shows up with a whirlwind, and Elijah is, is taken up from, heaven, from earth into heaven. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. You know, and it's, it's really reminiscent of what happens in Genesis when God takes Enoch. Yeah, Genesis says, Enoch walked with God and then was not. He didn't die. He just went straight from earth to heaven. And that's what happens to Elijah. But before he goes, before this happens, he asks Elijah, is there anything I can do for you? And Elijah makes this request. I would like a double portion of your spirit. Now, if we read that today, we're like, now, what in the world is a double portion of your spirit? Is it 
they ask you to do like twice as many miracles, they ask for twice as much power, what, what does that mean? And in the story, in, in that culture, that was the language of inheritance. So a, a firstborn son would get two-thirds of his father's property. So he would have got two times as much as the others would split the last third. So that was a double portion. So what Elisha was saying to Elijah is, I'm your spiritual son. I am your successor. And I'm asking you to, to give me what you have. And, and Elijah said, well, I mean, I can't. That's, that's God's thing. And then he's taken up. And his mantle comes down. And Elisha picks up the mantle. And he goes back to the Jordan River because they're on the other side. So he's coming back into the land. And he rolls it up. You know, I don't know what it looked like. But, you know, I, I always think, you know, like I was at camp all week. So I thought it was a rat tail. Uh, so I remember rolling rat tails at camp. And he, and he hits the water. And until that moment, he doesn't know. And he prays this prayer. Basically, like, God, are you with me? Like you were with Elijah, he touches the water and the Jordan parts, and he walks across on dry land, and he knows that, that God has answered that prayer, that he is now the, the prophet in Israel, and he has a role and a mission and a ministry to carry out. Elijah laid his mantle down, and Elisha picked it back up. So when we're talking about laying mantles down and picking mantles up, what, what am I talking about in the context of today? And so let's first talk about laying your mantle down. Laying your mantle down. And when I talk about that, I'm talking about mentoring and trusting and championing, championing, championing the next generation uh, to carry out and carry on the mission and the ministry of the church. That, that us who are in my generation and older, we, we mentor and we trust and we champion the next generation, to carry on the mission and the ministry of the church. I have a, I have a good friend who goes to church here, and uh, he and I are about the exact same age, same place in life, we think about the same, and we get together for coffee sometimes, and we're like, can you believe that like, retirement age is not that far away, like compared to how much we've worked in life already? And it just starts to mess with our heads a little bit, like, what are we going to do? And I think about this whole thing of passing the mantle, laying the mantle down. What does it look like? It's my whole life, essentially. In, in church leadership, doing the mission and the ministry of the church. What does it look like for me to lay the mantle down and to, and to mentor and, and trust and champion the next generation? What's that look like for me? And then what does it look like for me, like, past that? What, is, what does that role look like for me with God? And, and it, it's, it's crazy. Like, it really messes with my head a little bit. But I know I've got to figure this out. Because this is crucial. This idea that the older generation lays their mantle down and the younger generation picks it up is crucial because if we don't get this right, from a human perspective, if we don't get this right, the handoff doesn't happen. And, and we really mess it up, you know, for the gospel and, and for God's plan for the church. Again, from a human perspective, God can superintend all of that. I understand that. But, but that challenges me to want to do this well. Uh, and so if, if you're here today and you're in my generation or, or the next generation older than me, here, here's my question. What are you doing? What am I doing to, to lay the mantle down so it can be picked up by the next generation? What are you doing to lay the mantle down so it can be picked up by the next generation? You know, as I think about that, um, it's hard sometimes to lay the mantle down. Sometimes we don't do that good a job of it. Sometimes we, we don't want to lay the mantle down or... We just do, you know, we just kind of botch the handoff, you know, kind of like in the Olympics, the, was it the Chinese team, there was this Olympic handoff in, in the 4x400, in the and it was a mess, and, and the Americans have had a couple times where we botched the handoff, so what does it look like to do it right, and why sometimes do we have such a hard time, if you're my age, you're a little older, of, of laying the mantles down, and I think there's a couple reasons I jotted down. One, um, there's no intentionality. So Elijah... Spent about four years with Elisha. In fact, last week we talked about soul care and, and how God had Elijah go up to Mount Sinai and, and, and spend some time with him there. And we didn't talk about what he told him to do, but one of the things he told him to do is go anoint Elisha. And so then for the next four years, they, they spent time together, and Elijah was intentional. Sometimes we forget 
as, as we go through, and, and again, in my generation and older, we're just we're serving and we're serving, you know, the church needs us, and we're serving and we're doing it, and we forget to bring somebody along with us in the process. And and we forget to mentor people so that at some point when we lay the mantle down, we get somebody there to do it. So sometimes no intentionality. Um, sometimes the challenge for us is burnout. And here's what that looks like. And I know I know friends like this, who have, I have friends who this is what they struggle with. They spent their whole life serving the church and serving the Lord. And they get frustrated because they're like, where are the people that were like me when I was young? And, and why aren't they serving? Why aren't they doing it? And they get bitter. And when it comes time to lay the mantle down, instead of laying it down, they just pack it up. Or they, they burn it and throw it in the trash. Because they're like, this is stupid. I'm never going to serve again. And there's too many of these young people they should be serving. And the reason the young people aren't serving is because sometimes us who are older don't step aside and make room. Or we don't bring them along with us. So, so sometimes it's intentionality. Sometimes it's, it's burnout. Uh, sometimes it can be we don't trust. There's no trust. We don't trust the younger generation to do it right or do it as well as we're going to do. And by the way, they're not going to do as well as we did. We've been doing it for a long time. When they start, they're not going to be as good. You know, like you're 19. What, you know, you have limited life experience. You're going to mess up sometimes. That's okay. We did too. I want to apologize to so many of the churches that I've worked at and served in. I want to apologize to that, that family camp that asked me to do a devotion. This is when I should have known I, should, I was going to be a pastor. They asked me to do this, this devotion at family camp. I talked about an hour and a half. And, and those poor people, those poor innocent people that they let me loose on, I want to apologize in heaven. I'm going, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So you've got to, we've got to trust them. We've got to realize that they're going to make mistakes. We also have to realize that they will do it differently than we did because they're trying to reach a different generation. And do you remember when you were young and you're like, why are we having to sing all the I remember saying this. Why are we going to sing all those hymns, man? I don't want to like those hymns. I want to sing music that speaks to me. I want to be authentic. I still hear people say the same thing. Authentic. I'm like, I want to be authentic. I thought we were, now we're not anymore, apparently. But, you know, you know what I mean? So it's just, this happens. And we don't want to let go because we don't trust. Uh, sometimes, I see this happen a lot, is we say, well, wait, I don't have time to train people. I don't have time to mentor people. I see this in, in ministry. I see this in the workplace. That people get so busy. And they think that if they stop to train somebody and mentor somebody and bring them along, that somehow that's going to be detrimental to them. What they don't realize is now you've cloned yourself in another person. You're going to turn them loose and see what God does in them, through them. And not only that, now you've made margin for yourself so that God can do even more things through you. Uh, another reason, and this is a challenge, and I think this is a challenge that we'll be yet, uh, is your mantle is your identity. The things that you do become your identity. A lot of retirees have a difficult when they retire because some of them, their work was who they were. And if your work is who you are or your ministry is who you are or the way you serve is who you are and you can't do that anymore, it becomes a huge challenge. I love to mess with my buddy Charlie, our janitor. He, one of his favorite things to do in, in, the, in the world is ride motorcycles. But that's his only hobby. And I'm like, hey man, like what happens when you're not going to be able to ride anymore? And he was just like, here in the headlines. I'm like, dude, you, make, you have a backup hobby just in case. You know, what happens? You can't write anymore. I don't want to talk about it. Like, so sometimes our mantle is our identity. And then finally, sometimes, I don't know if this happens too often, but maybe we just, we don't want to look bad. We don't want to look bad. You don't want the younger generation to come in and do it way better than you. I hope they do it way better than me. I, by the way, they will do it better than me. I'm bad at reaching the next generation because I'm old now. I hate that. I used to think I was so cool. I'm not cool anymore. I'm just a dad. I tell dumb dad jokes. I dress like a dad. I got dad shoes. My wife goes, why do you wear those shoes? They're like old man shoes. I go, I am an old man now, honey. I mean, look at my hair. I want them to, I want them to make you look bad. All right? So important, though, that we learn to do this. In fact, this is how Jesus designed the church to work. In 2 Timothy 2, too, Paul writes, uh, you heard from me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach those truths that other trustworthy people 
who will be able to pass them on to others. So for us, who are my generation, a little bit old, a couple things to, to remember as we think about what does it look like? What does it look like to lay your hands? One is, is intentional. We need to be intentional. We need to think about this. We need to bring people, whatever we're doing, wherever we're serving, find somebody younger who maybe hasn't found a spot yet and go, hey, come help me with this thing. I'm doing blah. She come out. It'll be a lot of fun. We'll go out to, you know, grab some coffee out there. Bring them along. Because it's more caught than taught. I had two amazing youth pastors when I was younger. Amazing. Uh, I can't remember for the life of me a single lesson or message or anything that they taught. But you know what I do remember? I remember those two guys love Jesus, they love their families, and they love us as kids. They love me. And they brought us along into their lives and showed us what it looked like to love Jesus in life. And that's what we need to do, is be intentional about bringing them along. And then humility. We need to be humble. We need to be okay. We want them to succeed. We need to be kingdom-minded so that they get better than us and we go, it's on yours, baby. How can I, how can I champion you? How can I mentor you? How can I coach you? Tell me how you need me to now serve you. It's imperative, it is imperative that we train up the next generation to pick up the mantle of the mission and the ministry of the church because that is how we are going to reach the next generation and future generations for Christ. We need to invite younger folks. That's how I know I'm old. I used to turn out younger folks. We need to invite the next generation into leadership. We need to not just give them a seat at the table. We need to give them a voice at the table. We need to allow the next generation to, to, to try stuff and fail and succeed. We need to. They need to. We need to be committed to the mission and the ministry and, of the church and to Jesus Christ, not to practices and programs and, and policies. They're going to do it different because it needs to be done differently if they're going to reach their generation. I love what Craig Rochelle, Craig Rochelle's a pastor at Life Church, and he says, uh, we will do anything short of sin to reach people who don't know Christ. The reality is processes are going to change. I was, a, I was a kid, I came to Christ in the 70s, at the end of the 70s. Disco was still alive when I came to Christ. <laughs> you know, the world's changed. Processes are going to change, but people's need for Jesus is never going to change. Culture is going to change. But a culture's need for Jesus is never going to change. Music is going to change. Yet again. But the one we worship and the one we sing to will never change. So as an older generation, my age, older, we learn to lay that mantle down, be intentional and humble, and, and lay it down so others can pick it up. Now, let me talk to, I have two sons. One is a, a, a millennial and one is a Gen Z. So they're kind of right in that heart from, from you know, that late, mid to late teens all the way to their mid to late 30s. Let me talk to you guys for a second. Let me tell you this, if that's you, the church needs you. And I'm talking just about CCI. I'm talking about the big C church. The big C church needs you. We, we need you. We need you to pick up that mantle and, and to reach your generation and future generation for Jesus. We need you to take the church into the future. And, and as I was thinking about this, again, Eagle Side is a great place. Greg, I appreciate what you're doing up there, man. It is a great place to get away and, and to hear from God. And, and I think our generation, at times, has not done a great job. I hear, you know, you read about millennials who are leaving the church left and right. I think sometimes the reason they're leaving the church is because we've done a really lousy job of modeling Christ. And I don't mean us in this room necessarily. And if this does apply to you, then, you know, let's always be talking about that. But I think generationally, there's been this thing where we're really committed in my generation to God's word. And if, if the Bible says it, then that settles it, right? And we're gung-ho about that on Sundays. But then sometimes the rest of the week, we look like everybody else. And, and so millennials and younger people look at that and they're like, okay, so you're saying this is all really important stuff, and yet you only live it on Sunday. And they're going, that doesn't sound like real faith to me. Which it isn't. Like, that's the book of James. Right? James is like, if you're not, you say this and you're not doing that, you've got a dead faith. 
I think sometimes we have not modeled true faith for you guys. We, we need to do it better, and we need you to do it better. So forgive us if we've done a lousy job of modeling faith. I think another thing we've struggled with sometimes is we dumb down the call of God. Um, again, with this, uh, in, in, a, in a really good, positive desire to reach people for Jesus, we sometimes have turned Jesus into a really safe, nice guy that we want to have in our lives. And we've turned God into, you know, the, the big man of the sky who, you know, when the chips are down, we give him a call and he comes and helps us out. And, and that's not the call of the gospel. That's not the call that Jesus has put out to us as believers. His call is a lot higher and a lot harder. He said, he said this. He said, I want you to die to self. And that's exactly what it sounds like. Your desires, your plans, your dreams for you, lay those down. Because I want you to live for me. I want the self part to die so that I can live in and through you. And then he says, not just die to self, I want you to, want you to pick up your cross daily and follow me. And, and the word cross, I mean, we, we go, oh yeah, cross, this is a cool thing. You know, we have one right here, and we wear them around our necks, and that's cool. This, again, if we were in the first century, no one would have this in their church. That is, even though that is the sign of our faith, the symbol of our faith, that is, for us, it would be a gas chamber or a guillotine. It's an executioner's thing. And when he says, take up your cross, what he's saying is, if you're following me, it's not about you, and you've got to be ready to die. Not just die yourself, but die down. And there's people in this world who are doing that today for Jesus just because they've decided to be a follower, to, call, to, to pick up the call of Jesus and to walk with him. And then he says, I want you to follow me. I want you to walk where I walk. Wherever I go, that's where I want you to go. Whatever I do, that's what I want you to do. And then, just so we don't misunderstand that call, Jesus says, let me make it very clear. If you want to save your life, you want to do it your way, you're going to lose it. But if, if you lose your life for my sake, and again, there's a double meaning here. It's, it's not only dying yourself, it's you might lose your life for my sake, but you will save it. In your life. I think our call, sometimes, that we have painted for you in the younger generation is more of like a SpongeBob SquarePants theme song. <laughs> Who lives in a pineapple under a sea? Under the sea. Who does? SpongeBob SquarePants. Absorbent? Yellow, of course, a sea. If not, a nonsense is something you wish to drop on the deck and flop like a fish. It's kind of like, oh, come on, Jesus, it'll be fun. Woo, Jesus, we like you. He's cool. He's nice. He's my buddy. And Jesus is my friend. Like, I like spending time with him. But he's made a high call. The call of Jesus is way more Willy Wonka. Right? You know, you know, make pray hard. Great. You know, Mel Gibson would face pain. He's out in front of these Scottish Highlanders. And they're like, number one, we don't believe you're going to us. But number two, you're calling us to fight? Now, nah. we fight, we're going to die. We're going to run so we can live. And, he's, and, and William Wallace says, fight and die. Run, and you'll live at least a while. And die in your beds. Many years from now. Would you be willing to trade all the days from this day till that for one chance, just one chance, to come back here and tell our enemies that they take our lives, but they'll never take our life? That's the call of the gospel for me. And if we've done a bad job of communicating that, I'm sorry, but the call is to come and die if necessary. To step up and say, I'm a Christian, and I love Jesus, I love you, and if you don't love me because of that, I understand. But that's not going to make me stop loving Jesus, and that's not going to make me stop loving you, and no matter what you do to my body, you can have it, because Christ has my soul. That's the call. And I'm calling you, Gen Z, millennials, to step up. The Big C Church needs you. We need you to answer the call, to pick up the mantle. And sometimes we're going to do a really lousy job of laying it down, and you might have to grab it out of our hands and kind of kick us in the chest. It's the mantle. 
I'll take it. And you're going to have to put up with us going, oh, you know. It's okay. Put up with it. Because the cost is too It's too, we don't want to mess it up. We don't want to mess this up. We need you to step up, to take leadership, to take ownership, to take the church into the future and do a better job than you did. You know, model what Jesus looked like, what love of Jesus looks like. The Great Commission. Great command. The great commandment, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. The great commission, go in all the world. Go in all the world, preach the gospel, and make disciples. Do a better job than we've done. Doing those things. Don't water down the call when it comes time to step up and you're standing where I'm standing. Don't make Jesus a buddy. Don't make God, you know, Ghostbusters. We get a call. Set these standards. Come and die. Take the next generation, the lady or man pronounce that they can take the next generation, and take the church to the next generation. We're counting on you. And my generation, I'm counting on us to learn, to bring people along with us, to be intentional, to champion, be humble, be kingdom minded, so they can do it. Let me pray. Ooh, Lord Jesus, thank you for your goodness and your grace. May you give a double portion of your spirit to the next generation as they stand, step up, and answer the call. Pick up the man. And for my generation, may you help us to be intentional and humble and, and learn how to bring people along and to love on them and to champion them. Uh, and him who is able to do exceedingly abundant and far beyond all we can ask or imagine. According to the power that we're sitting him be the glory in the church in Christ Jesus for now and for all generations. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hey, I want to, I was going to say this one message in my notes, but I don't know if it. But I want to say one guy, there's a guy that just is so cool. I, I, I think it's so cool that the pastor Nathan, you, you recruited him. This is a guy who's in his 70s. And he mentors. See, is it sophomores? Yeah. Sophomore boys. Sophomore boy. If you're a sophomore boy here today, you you guys have a gift. Billy Gum stepped up and he is mentoring these young guys. He is laying his mantle down so they can pick it up and made his tribe increase. It's awesome. And if that's you, man, like Nate, hopefully this message will kick some more people to help you out, all right? So go help the kids. Be crazy, all right? They need you. All right. Well, thanks, Pastor Pat, for that. Uh challenging message, and no matter what generation um, you are a part of, um, we are all um, a part of the, the church body that gets to uh, be blessed and to bless others. And so on behalf of all those who receive um, from, from your generosity, whether it's the kids in our kids' ministry or the youth um, on Wednesday nights, whether it's the adults, um, young adults or old adults, um, I just want to say thank you. As we come today to the end of our fiscal year, we're going to have our, our annual business meeting um, at noon today. Um, but uh, I just want to say um, how, how thankful we are for your generosity um, and for God's faithfulness through you uh, to, to us as a church family and to all of our ministry partners. So on behalf of those around the world, whether it's the, the girls in Guatemala or the, um, the school, there and in Pakistan, whether it's the churches uh, in Russia and um, in Albania and other places of the world, you guys are, are making an impact uh, in God's kingdom through your generosity. So thank you for that. And as the ushers come today, um, I want to pray uh, for our offering. And so would you join me in that? God, we uh, give you thanks for who you are in our lives uh, as our creator, as our savior. God is the one who gives us every good and perfect gift um, comes from you. So God, right now we give back to you out of grateful and thankful hearts for all you've done for us. We pray in Jesus' name.
splendor of the King. Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice. Trembles at his voice. How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? And all will see how great, how great is our God. Thing, so tell us you're coming. That'd be great. Let's just what you plan for that. 
Uh, we got right now out in the lobby, come out and say hey to the pals uh, right before you leave, and then we'll hang out. But about noon, we're going to transition over into the chapel for our annual meeting. Thank you guys so much for being here. Love you guys. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of God the Father, and uh, I got it wrong. Love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Awesome. See you next week, guys. Bye bye.